Hey, everyone. This amazing ESO Network show is brought to you by our fine sponsor, Amazon.com. Please remember to shop Amazon for all your geeky needs, no matter what time of the year it is. All you need to do is go to ESOPodcast.com slash ESO Amazon. Or click on the Amazon banner on the ESO Network webpage to go to our e-store. It's the best way to shop and the best way to support this program, and it doesn't cost you anything extra. Okay, that's enough of me babbling for now. Now on with your regular scheduled show. Hey, Kevin. Hey, Cornflake. So we host the Flopcast. We cover nerd and geek subjects of all types, but this is sort of a sillier, goofier side of geekdom, I'd say. We love to talk about music, especially funny music. We talk about comic books, conventions. Saturday morning cartoons! Oh yeah. I'd say if you're going to put the Flopcast in Brady Bunch terms, we're like the Cousin Oliver of podcasting. (laughs) And we do a ridiculous new Flopcast episode every week. What is wrong with us? We really have nothing else to do. (laughs) We're part of the Earth Station One Podcast Network. And you can find us at Flopcast.net. Hello and welcome again to the Monster Sci-Fi Show Podcast. I am your host, The Monster, back to give you another week of sci-fi news. So, we have a lot to talk about. But, let's start off with the news that happened just a couple hours ago. Don Rickles has passed away. He had died of uh, kidney failure at the age of 90. And you may be thinking, well, why am I mentioning the obvious another celebrity died? But if you know of what he has done, and animation-wise, then you know he was Mr. Potato Head in the Toy Story movies. So he was the voice of Mr. Potato Head in Toy Story 1, 2, 3... And four, which is currently in production. So, I'm not sure if this hampers what is going to be done. For all I know, his speaking parts have already been done. But I'm hoping that that's the case. That it doesn't have to alter the story. I would hate to think that if his part was not done that we would have to get someone else to do the voice of Mr. Potato Head, a la Don Rickles. So, I'll find out as time goes on, but uh, sad to know that another legend has died, but considering how long he has lived, for 90 years again, as I mentioned, I am not so much sad, but I'm just happy that whatever suffering that he has gone through is now over, And we can look back at his life and see the amount of laughs he generated constantly. I mean, I remember growing up watching this celebrity roast with Dean Martin way back in the days, uh, in the 70s. uh, He was pretty out there. And it wasn't as if he was being um, offensive with curse words or anything like that. He was just very smart. And yes, he was very almost non-political uh, in, in for his time, which, you know, it might be offensive now, but there is no other insult comic other than Triumph that's currently a hand puppet. Hate to break it to you guys. But we really don't see that type of comedic uh, point of view in which he's just insulting everybody. And the humor comes from that. And it's hysterical. And you almost want to be insulted by him as a badge of honor. So, so again, I'll keep you posted as to what happens with Toy Story 4. All right. Uh, another quick tidbit for those of you who are living in Florida like I am. We're one step closer from actually getting a Tron light cycle ride, which is going to be really cool but 
the one thing that I had a problem with, and I was looking over the pictures, and I'm like, it's an awesome scenario of actually riding a roller coaster in a light cycle. Except I want to be the one that's in front of this human centipede Tron cycle ride. I don't want to be the back end and get everyone's other waste in my mouth. <laughs> but that's the first thing I thought about. It just looks like a Tron human centipede ride. That's all. It, it was kind of weird. So am I wrong in thinking about this as this kind of weird horror movie ride? Maybe. That's just my perception on things. But hey, nonetheless, I want to get on that damn ride. And maybe, as I mentioned in earlier podcasts, we might get a Tron sort of new movie with Jared Leto. But who knows? But nonetheless, we get that. I'm cool with that. All right. The next big thing, I talked about the the T-Rapist 1, I mean the Trappist 1 system in which scientists have discovered there's possibly new planets, a couple of Earth-like planets that we can actually go to, but of course being that it's too damn far, well, there seems to be a problem now. Because of the short cycle that it spins around its sun, those planets are more subjected to solar storms and would wreak havoc on the surface. And the storms that would be on the surface will be even worse, several times worse than what we ever experience here on Earth. So, how's that to end your week on things on a bright spot? Want to leave Earth? Nope, you cannot. So... Going from bad to worse, news this week that Michael Bay has more Transformers on the way. How many? 14 more Transformer movies coming down the pike. Starting with the Bumblebee spin-off coming out in 2018, which is supposed to be more a kid-friendly version of the Transformers. As long as we don't get... The Ghetto Bots, I'm on board, but 14? I'll be 64, and that's assuming they do one Transformer movie a year. And that's not going to happen, because at least it's going to take a couple of years in between these movies. Our... Every other year. Let's be pragmatic here. They want to spend that universe big time. So I'll be actually retired. Hopefully. By the time. Maybe two or three or four. Are left over from the Transformer series. Oh Jesus. Okay. Will it still be relevant. Till I'm 64. Will you still need me. Will you still feed me when I'm 64? <laughs> Change my diapers or something. I don't know. All right. And the other news is that Doctor Who, for the last season with Peter Capaldi, we are getting not one master, but two masters. Not a master's in degrees of business administration, but the master, the one that David Tennant fought with, and we're going to get Missy back. So how this is all going to play, I don't know. I don't care. I just want this to happen, and I'm excited to have two masters go against a doctor. So bring it on. If it's going to be the last season for him, make it the best kick-ass season. And that news really made me happy. All right, so our big three topics... Looks like Squirrel Girl is going to get a TV series. That sounds nuts to me. The other one is going to be, I want to talk about the Project Scorpio. So we did have some specs that came out today about the new Xbox system. I am not going to be overly techy on it. But I'm going to talk about things that 
is of um, of interest to me in which it may make some sense to you and hopefully that might get your interest in the coming E3 conference that's coming up in June and then I'm going to be talking about Akira supposedly there is now rumors about a possible director for the live action movie of Akira and I will tie this into Ghost in the Shell from my review as well because it does have some influence on what's going to happen. Plus, I'm going to do a review of Legends of Tomorrow at the very end for the season finale, so if you have not seen that, I'll let you know at a certain point in which I'm going to talk about Legends of Tomorrow, so if you have not seen it, or if you don't care to hear me talk any further, that's when you can stop the podcast. Let's get started with Squirrel Girl. This October, blasting into comic shops and bookstores. The wildest, biggest, most consequential battle in comic book history. The unbeatable Squirrel Girl beats up the Marvel Universe. Alright, so that was the trailer to the Squirrel Girl beats up the Marvel Universe. Which... I've heard about the character, I've never read it until just now. I've read the the first issue or two. uh, Just to prepare, just to kind of get my ideas about who Squirrel Girl is. And um, it's fine. It's funny and it's campy and I get the whole, you know, cuteness of the squirrel angle. Uh, But my question is, is that is this going to be the right direction that Marvel wants to go with its TV universe? Mind you, Marvel with these, with uh, Disney, the Marvel ex- uh, Cinematic Universe, that is pretty much lock and key. That's perfectly set up to run on its own and how it's all built up, how it's all connected. The TV side which we have Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., we have the Netflix series with Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, and now Iron Fist. And then we're going to get the Inhumans later on this year in September. We are going to get, in 2018, Cloak and Dagger. So, in the mix with all that is Squirrel Girl, who is going to be part of, an, I guess, an, an ensemble cast called The New Warriors. Which, if they're going to go with the whole comedy angle, like the uh, the Powerless TV series, like they do on NBC, which I love tremendously, I'm kind of, kind of on board with what they'll plan to do with this character. The problem lies is that they haven't really fleshed out that whole TV side as successfully as Mar- as DC has done with the CW shows, the Supergirl, Flash, Legends of Tomorrow, and Arrow. And even though Gotham runs on Fox, it is still a DC show, and it doesn't really interact with any other properties. At least there is some connection to DC properties with the CW. Now, with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., since season two, they had the whole set of premise about the Inhumans and just word about that new series is that they may not even connect or meet at all or in have a shared universe. So it just kind of dumbfounds me as to why are you having a series that is not connecting? So in a grand scheme of all this, if you're going to do this series with Squirrel Girl, is she going to be connected to the larger universe? And if not, you're going to make it his own micro universe? It's kind of a weird time for Marvel and, and its TV side because we're coming into home stretch for uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. season four. And the last couple of episodes have been interesting in this direction. So, it's not that it's so much better. I think they're looking at telling your smaller stories. I think you would need to have all the support possible to kind of 
have characters cross over, just so there is interest, just so there is something that you feel it's all connected. And I get the logic of rewarding fans who've been with the show since day one, but we've come to have an expectation, and it's Marvel's fault with Disney's money, to connect all the movies together. So, with the TV side, it really hasn't come together at all. So, I'm just kind of curious, is that, is this even needed? And, sure, again, I refer to Powerless, I love Powerless, but does DC, does Marvel need to do a Squirrel Girl series to kind of compete with Powerless? I don't know if it's going to be picked up for a second season, but right now, every episode since the first one has gone better, and the, the the comic performances are phenomenal. I really enjoyed everyone on that cast. So, I get what they're doing, and I didn't believe in the premise about having um, a superhero story with hardly any superheroes, because the focus are the powerless people. So, now, if we do Squirrel Girl, is this going to be like a parody on superheroes like The Tick was? Or are you going to just have a story about a quirky girl who just happens to have powers of a squirrel, but the, the quirkiness is the character, not so much the superhero aspect? So, this is all still new to the mix and I'm just kind of curious how this is all going to fit but it, it just seems kind of weird to all of a sudden do a funny comedic show when Marvel stuff has been pretty much you know a lot more serious subjects there's a lot more action very little in the way of lightness that's straight out like powerless I don't know. I'll see what happens in the future with that. But, you know, I I guess Marvel is trying to do something different with its property. And for all intents and purposes, again, I admit I'm a DC fan, just like I'm a Marvel fan, but I love DC more. But I think Marvel is trying to play catch-up in this case with DC as far as their TV properties. And... I don't think there is a good sense that this is going to work out continuity-wise. Because again, we got Netflix, we got all those four heroes uh, working together in the Defender series coming up. But are the Defenders going to meet with the people from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? No. Are the people from Inhumans going to cross over to Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? No. Is Squirrel Girl going to show up on the Defenders? I doubt it. But considering if it's going to be in the same universe, which is Earth, why is it this not more part of a a cohesiveness that I think is what's missing? So we'll see what happens with that series. So let's go on to the Xbox Scorpio project. When we think about the future of Xbox, we think about removing barriers. For me and for the fans and for the developers, Xbox has always meant innovation and the latest technology and delivering the world's most powerful console is something we absolutely want to do. This is the console that developers asked us to build. They wanted a console that had no boundaries, had no limitations. And that technology component to us is what we really need to make our vision and our art come alive. When I saw the specs of this thing, I'm like, wow, I got true to like, they're really going for it. They're not holding anything back. All right, so I played a little bit of the trailer that came out in E3 last year, in which Microsoft talked about um, the new Xbox system, which is called, or the code name is Scorpio. So, of course, we don't know if that's going to be the name of the new console. But for right now, that's what that is. <laughs> so, uh, as I mentioned before, I'm not going to get too geeky in this. Because uh, I can read you specs. And I can say, well, 
it's more than what the other systems have. Or, okay. Like, for example, Scorpio has 8 core CPU and a high clock GPU with 12 gigabytes and of GDDR5 memory. Explain that to me in layman's terms. <laughs> I don't know. All I know is that it's one of those things I remember watching um, on Saturday Night Live. Janine Garofalo was on for one season, and there was a sketch called Monkey Clean, in which they had a monkey that was in a box, and you open up the box, and it will clean your bathroom. And Janine Garofalo's character was like, you know, I don't know where monkeys come from. I don't care what happens to them. All I know is that that my bathroom is monkey fresh and monkey clean. So, and of course, once the cleaning was done, the monkey gets disposed away like trash. Like me, it's like you get the new console, all you care about that it works. And sure, it's faster. That's obvious. But why is it faster? Or how do you understand the difference between the old system versus the new system? Other than you're paying a lot more money for a newer system. Well, the big thing is going to be this: it's the true 4K screen that you're going to have the gameplay with a higher frame rate because of the power that it can process all that graphic information. So I had to look up the difference between the CPU versus the GPU. So I saw this quick video that Amy... Uh, Amy that Adam and Jamie <laughs> from uh, Myth, Mythbusters did. And they were trying to explain the difference between what CPU is versus GPU. All right. So they did a demonstration in which they had a robot that was going to paint a picture. And they named it Leonardo. And it shot a paintball paintballs against a blank canvas... And and did it sequentially, so it was like a basically a smiley face, but it started like a clock going around clockwise. Um, so I did the whole circle, and then it did the half smile, and then it did the eyes after that. So that's CPU. So it it does things sequentially, but it was like not. It wasn't like. Like, think about it, if you're downloading a picture, you don't get the whole information until it all comes down and it gets all processed, and then it's complete. You get the whole picture. The GPU, they came up with Leonardo 2.0, in which they had these two massive air tanks, and attached to those air tanks were these, um, I guess, color tubes. So they had hundreds of of colored tubes attached to uh, I guess like paint cannons so what they explained was that once you hit the button to Leonardo 2.0 it sent out all the paint all at the same time it hit this blank canvas and there it was a picture, a multicolored pixelated picture of the Mona Lisa. That was all at the same time. So less than a second, you had a picture that was done by paint versus Leonardo 1.0, the CPU, which did the paint sequentially. So there's kind of the difference, and that's the example, and I hope you can see that in your head, what I'm talking about. If not, look it up. You can see it real quick. It's about two minutes long, but it made sense in my head about what's the difference. Now, because the system has a lot more memory, it can take a lot of information off the disk that when we get it, and you know you have to download that onto your hard drive, it's going to uncompress all that data much, much faster. So my concern 
why are we going to still worry about, and they better not, dealing with legacy disk? One of the benefits that I loved at the very beginning when I got the Xbox was that I loaded the game into my hard drive. That's all I needed to do. I didn't need to re-put in my disk. If I just wanted to stay in bed, I'll just play and switch the games out or watch Netflix or do it both at the same time. That's what I loved about it. But now all of a sudden, I don't know why I have to put in the disk. Not so much that I didn't download it, because I did, but I'm stuck with having to put the physical disk inside in order for me to play the game that's already installed on my hardware. That's the kind of thing that I'm really still ticked about. Now, granted, the new console will be also backwards compatible. So because of the extra uh, processing with the GPU, we are going to get a lot more texture in the older games for Xbox One and uh, Xbox 360. So it's not going to be, you know, all of a sudden you'll get a 4K game that was from, you know, 10, 15 years ago. That's not going to happen. But there is going to be some enhancements. At least it shows a lot more... uh, processing power that you could not achieve with the Xbox One because of what it was already doing. So because of the new system, you'll have that plus more to process more of the frame rates and get a better picture overall. So, you know, instead of watching VHS, you're going to get Blu-ray quality. So it's a much bigger difference. And of course, You're going to have to invest then in a 4K TV. So, yes, this all sounds great, but, you know, you're going to be paying at least $500. And there hasn't really been an estimate, but consider it $500 for a new system. Plus, if you're going to get a new TV, 4K is still pretty high. And, yes, it's going to drop down in price, but it's still not at the point where a couple hundred dollars you can pick up a new TV for that. I'm not going to plunk down anything over a grand for a TV. So I like keeping up with, not so much the Joneses, but it gets to be a point. It's like, well, how much more are you going to keep on developing? How much more are you going to be pushing with technology? Now, the only thing that I don't know what's going on is the Microsoft HoloLens. They projected that's going to be, I think, two years ago working with with Minecraft, nothing really has come of it, per se, as far as gameplay or how it's going to be developed. Maybe that's what's going to happen down the road with Scorpio. That could be happening in the announcements come E3, which, again, I'll do a nice coverage on that like I did last year. But, honestly, right now, with as much as I'm doing with podcasting, I have almost zero time to do any gameplay, especially since my son does a lot of playing on the system itself. So any free time that he has on a weekend, he's doing that, which doesn't leave me much of anything to do on the Xbox. So I think I may wait. I'm not really that interested in getting rid of my Xbox, let alone my 360, although it's not working right now. I got a semi-ring of death. I'm just waiting for all the games that I have for the 360 to start working on my Xbox One. So then I can feel at least a little more confident in my gaming abilities, because I, again, I played a lot of games before. I got the Xbox One, but because my son is playing a lot more of those games... I don't get to play. So we'll see whatever happens with the Project Scorpio, the new Xbox console in the future. But again, the problems I had is the legacy disc. I can't wait to see how things are going to be eventually backwards compatible for all the games. So maybe that will be something that will be on day one. That will be nice. That we don't have to wait for the games to be converted that'll be a plus rather than having to wait from Xbox to do the backwards compatibility it's right off the box you just plug in your own 
the old disc and you're good to go. If that's the case, maybe. I'll, I'll maybe plunk down the money on day one. But again, I can wait. <laughs> All right, so let's move on to Akira. All right, so that was music from the movie, the anime movie, Akira. So, before I even get to start with this movie, let's talk about what's going on with Ghost in the Shell with Scarlett Johansson. Alright, so, I started this podcast Thursday night, and now it's Sunday night. I purposely waited to talk about what was going on with the overseas market, namely China, because it opened up on Friday in China. So the overseas market was going to really help the box office, basically, for Ghost in the Shell. So it did that perfectly. So it pulled in about $41 million over the weekend. So um, it's now about $124 million globally. So it's going to be not so much of a hard pill to swallow, but again, the high price tag of a hundred million dollars plus the, the marketing, you're you're not going to make it to the point where you're going to break even. There is going to be a loss in here, and again, everything boils down to that whole whitewashing controversy. That really, that was the main focus, and without a lot of people watching the movie or knowing what was in the context of the movie. Everyone's reaction to the whitewashing controversy. Now, I bring that up in the face of Akira. Akira is a phenomenal anime movie that I saw back in the... Two, no. 1988, 89, I forget which year. But I saw it on the big screen. And I loved Akira. I loved what I saw on that screen. I have not read the manga, but for all intents and purposes, I can live without that, since I'm always still not clear how to read the books in the true Japanese way of right to left, and then the order in which it goes, because it's completely awkward. But in any case, what we have to deal with, if this movie is going to be made, we're looking at almost similar problems with the whitewashing controversy. In 2013, there was a screenwriter who was attached to write Akira. His name was Gary Wita. Now, he has written The Book of Eli, which I loved. He co-wrote the script with M. Night Shyamalan for a movie called After Earth. Which sucked. <laughs> we also had an early version, or the, the the story of Rogue One, a Star Wars story. That he co-wrote the story, not the writing, but co-wrote with uh, John Nell and Chris Weitz. So he also did three episodes of Star Wars Rebels, and he's done a couple, couple of other uh, uh, video game movies that he wrote. Now, one of the things that he wrote down, he says, I, and I'm going to read this for a quote. It says, so this is a quote that he gave to a writer to Slash Films. He said, I personally reject the argument that Akira is necessarily a Japanese story. And, it, and that's somehow sacrilegious to set a new adaptation of it anywhere else. I think many of the themes in that story are ones to speak to the human condition and are therefore relevant anywhere in the world. If that weren't true, the original versions would never have been a hit outside of Japan. And I think partially he's correct. 
And the majority of that is he is wrong. It's a hit outside of Japan of what it presented of Japan. It was not changed for the American audience aside from the subtitles or you know an English dub version. Other than other than that, it never changed. That's why it was a hit. Because of what it presented, not because it was adapted to an American audience. Again, except for subtitles and dubbing into an English language. To do a live action version of this, this is what we're going to have the same problem that we had with Ghost in the Shell. And it's sort of pseudo whitewashing. He went on to th- talk about how instead of doing New Tokyo, he was going to do New Manhattan. And while New Tokyo came from the ashes from the World War, the Manhattan version would be completely different because economically the U.S. was doing terribly and they would sell off Manhattan and that became like the setting for this. Again, when you boil down to what makes Akira interesting is what you saw on the screen. If you were to change the setting, you're not really doing Akira. If you change the characters, you're not doing Akira. Now, again, I talked about this in the Ghost in the Shell review. If you've not heard that, I'm, again, spoiling this if you have, so apologies. But in the context of the story, the major that Scarlett Johansson is playing is the original character that's in the anime. The difference in the movie is that because that character was Asian, the new host body made her look non-Asian to hide her identity and give her a new life. So you can explain away why she looks different than why she looks um, from the anime or the manga. And if you remember, I talked about Star Blazers, the live action that I saw. This is from, I think, a week ago, and I talked about this. And I said, the live action movie talked about how this ship that came from Japan, called the Yamato, was on its mission to save Earth. There was no mention about any other countries, but that was their story. They're the heroes, and they're the saviors of our planet. So their story is our story. So that part is correct, but no way would I want to see an American version of that because it would be different from what people loved. So, let's go back to, well, if I'm making this movie for a Western audience, which is all of us here in the States, do I want a bunch of non-recognizable characters and actors that are Asian? Is that what's going to sell me the movie? That could be a niche audience that's out there that would appreciate that. But if you want to have a big name attached, that's not going to be the right gender or ethnicity of that character that is portrayed in the different um, medium, which is, again, the anime movie. There's only so much you can do to justify that change. Does it mean it works? I don't buy this whole new Manhattan setting whatsoever and and have American actors portray Akira. I think that's crap. Let's put that all aside. I got too many other things to talk about. Okay, the latest news from this is that uh, Jordan Peele from Key and Peele, which is a great Comedy Central series that I love, had directed his first movie called Get Out, which is a low-budget movie that, um, I think, what's, 15? 
Oh no, it was uh, 4.5 million that made 140 million globally. So all of a sudden, hey, we got to get this guy on board. He's able to make this great movie for a low amount of money. Yes, that's always a good idea. But let's be realistic here. As much as I love Jordan Peele, and I know he loves science fiction, and so does um, his partner, the problem lies is that Akira is a very... The mise-en-scene, the setting of that world is very deep and rich and it's cluttered. I don't see how you can do this for less than a hundred million dollars. And if you're going to give a, I guess a second time director, a budget is going to be a hundred million dollars versus the 4.5 million dollars. I don't see the math happening that he's going to make a billion dollars for you. I don't know if he is going to be so super heavy in the CGI mixed with live action. How are you going to pull this off with the ultimate fight scene? I don't see how you can do this on a cheap. The only way you can do this on the cheap, remake the anime. That's all you can do. You want this to be, you know, under a hundred million dollars? Redo the anime. But why redo the anime when it was perfect the way it was? So I'm not knocking Jordan, but I don't think that he has enough technical skills to get to that point in which he can turn around, produce this movie the way it needs to be produced. Unless something happens and he comes up with a statement that makes me feel confident, that's fine. But until that time, considering the problems that we're having right now with Ghost in the Shell, Akira has to be taking place right where it belongs. If you want to make this a multicultural setting that happens to take place in Japan, Or Neo Tokyo? Fine. You want to put white actors? Then they're not going to be the the majority. They're the minority. So that's all I'm going to say about that. But Akira is almost sacrilegious to the point where I don't think you can do this faithfully without screwing up too much on the source material. And I don't know how you can do that otherwise. So, we shall see what happens, and I'll keep you posted with that. So, I'm going to stop the podcast at this point, because I'm going to move on to Legends of Tomorrow, Season 2 finale. So, I'll be talking about that episode, and in general, what I thought about Season 2. So, if you have not seen it, stop and come back to me when you have. If you don't care, continue listening to the podcast. So, let's get started with Legends of Tomorrow, season finale. QA, watch me for the changes and try to keep up. Gideon and I have calculated another aberration in Bhopal, 1912. Why can't it be Aruba, 2016? We are history's last line of defense. I like the sound of that. Have you gentlemen heard of the Spear of Destiny? The Spear could alter reality itself. Changes to history cause time quakes and aberrations which we can undo. Changes to reality, those are permanent. You're on the run because you're a time remnant. Now something's chasing you, trying to correct the aberration. One of history's worst monsters. The Legion have the Spear of Destiny! They're, They're like gods now! It appears that after the Legion got the Spear and changed reality, they kept us around as their pets. You'll be forced to live your lives in a reality that I create. We go back in time to 1916, and we stop the Legion from ever getting the Spear of Destiny in the first place. 
So that recap that was at the beginning of the season finale, which I loved, really summed up the whole season. But before I even get to the Aruba episode, the question that bugged me, and I had asked a couple of people from uh, another podcast if they can clarify, but if you remember from the ending of season one, the mission was over. Hawkman and Hawkgirl flew away. All of a sudden, another wave rider comes in. And there's someone getting out that's not from the cast. It's a completely different person. It's someone named Rex Tyler. Our man. He gives a warning for the legends to not get back on the wave rider because they would die. But then something happens when we see the season premiere of season two. They didn't say anything other than, well, let's start off with this. In season two, we don't get any of the characters yet. We get Nate. His introduction to us, as he's going to be a season regular, he has to get Oliver Queen to help out to help find the missing Wave Rider. Because supposedly, 1942, there was a bomb that went off. So, kind of flash forward through all this. We find Mick um, basically in suspended animation. And Mick tells us about the whole story about what happened to the crew. And basically... He gave this quick information about how Rex kind of faded away. And we don't really get information about that until season two, uh, episode 2, which makes sense of why he faded out according to Mick. So, if you remember, Reverse Flash came in. And pretty much killed Rex Tyler. He says, I, we've met before. You knew of my plans. You tried to, to warn the legends. But I'm here to stop you. So as he vibrated his hand right through him. Killing him. That version in the future basically blinked out. Okay. So if he blinked out. Then... They should not have had any memories of talking to him at all. Because if you remember, later on, I think it was the Raiders of the Lost Art episode with George Lucas on how Ray Palmer and Nate were losing their powers because George Lucas didn't write Star Wars. So once he wrote it, or promised to write it, their powers came back. So I'm thinking that that whole incident would never have happened and we should have never have had the JSA altogether. So it really didn't bug me until I saw the ending and I'm like, but what about the whole Rex going back into the future? How did that all work out? And that never did. So it's a bug that... I'm thinking that it's just a writer's thing that, yeah, we kind of let that slide a bit and just, well, let's just move on. All right, fine, let's just move on. Overall, I thought season two much, much better. We didn't have Rip as a character much in the season. And I think Sarah moving up into the role of leader after a couple episodes did a phenomenal, did a fantastic job carrying the team and really having the focus of knowing when to rely on the team or when went or when to make a hard decision or I meant when she was wrong but overall I think there were some f- great funny bits uh, especially Mick doing the narration at the very beginning it's like what part do you not get where the legends are so forth and it's like it, it's very self-aware in that sense. Or when the quote-unquote Legion of Doom 
did their version of the opening monologue. I love that when they got the Spear of Destiny and how they everything's been all changed, but then it was their narration at the beginning. So I can't be more than happy with what has happened and the fact that, of course, they were part of the Heroes versus Aliens crossover. So it was a lot of fun. My only thing that when it came down to the Aruba episode, it was kind of weird. And I'm kind of glad they didn't go certain ways. Is that because certain things happen in the future? Uh, Vixen, I forgot her name, <laughs> uh, had was killed. Basically, she was iced by Captain Cold, and basically, Flash, Reverse Flash, just kind of flicked it, and then she just crumbled away. So they come back into the past to stop themselves or basically do the thing that we're told not to do was to go back to a time that you occupied. And then that got really weird and complicated because you had doubles of everyone and there's two makes both drinkings, you know, on, on in the ship at one point. But even with that, it got even more interesting when Reverse Flash got his backup and all of a sudden the team was surrounded with multiple reverse flashes and I yell out, yelled out to the screen WTF really loud and thank god no one was here but I freaked out when I saw all of that happening so one of the things that I was just like okay I don't see this ending in a good way because basically a lot of the people were without powers there was no way they could ever deal with multiple flash let alone one flash you know he could literally run rings around you and you will never see that coming so by the time they cut through the action between different characters and they're getting beat up and so forth it should have been a lot quicker than they kind of let it linger a lot more but the whole idea was that the spirit of destiny that Sarah was holding, she had, excuse me, she had the moment in which she wanted to, or could have had the moment to bring back her sister. And she had the whole, I mean, she had the whole conversation with Laurel. So it was a nice moment to see Laurel back. And, but basically they took out the whole reverse flash didn't have powers moment so that's when the uh, the speed demon came and just killed <laughs> everyone was all gone and then basically he existed he became out of existence piece by piece and just was perfect but what's cool about that because of the multiple copies of each other when they went back Nate in the past died but the Nate from the future was upset that you know the vixen character was still uh, was still dead, but this one she was still alive in the past. So they kept that going so that the team was still together, but from different time periods. Which I thought that was kind of cool, and just left it at that. It's not as if we all went to the back uh, at the same time and then we were all together. No, they were basically the same person, but from different periods. And I thought nicely done kudos major kudos on that so with that we sort of get I guess the future kind of said okay except we come into I guess another what are we going to do now moments in which they get to the future 2017 Aruba but not Aruba they crash land and they're dinosaurs (laughs) so Boy, that's what I call a sticky situation. We'll see how they're going to get out of that one next season. So, this is all. This was basically only 17 episodes. I wish it went on for longer. But I think the cast is really well done. And I think the humor is what helps sew so many of the pieces together as far as the, the characters and how they bond. Again, Ray and Nate being like the best of buddies. 
or basically how you know Nate kind of grew on me over the season. I didn't hate him as much, but I think everyone, Mick especially, I think is one of the funniest characters on that show. And the fact that I went back to watch the first two episodes, and I just realized why in the in the last episode of Rubot that Mick is calling Nate pretty. Until I watched the first episode, I was like, oh, he's always called him pretty, but he says it so quick and subtly that I didn't, I missed it. But I thought that was funny. So, you know, he has his nickname for Ray, which is haircut, and for Nate, it's it's pretty. So, I, you have to give it up to Mick. Again, really enjoyable. The only negative thing throughout the whole series is. The lack of powers at certain times. There seems to be more a matter of convenience. Meaning, like Firestorm. You have the most powerful guy with superpowers. Not being paired off together to to do missions. Why? Because it's more convenient to have them be separated and then they can't convert. And I guess they have to save money somehow. And draw out more drama. Whereas, if I'm the team leader, you keep those two together no matter what. If they go to the bathroom, they go to the bathroom together. You don't want to keep them separated. You got to keep them separated. But that's the problem. That, I again, it was like convenient for them to go ahead. Oh, well, I'm going to split you two characters. What could go wrong? Lots of things can go wrong. But you never want to separate the best guy on your team separated. You have to keep them together. And what I also liked about those two, they're not bickering as much. It's more of an appreciation for both people. They understand each other. Since they share the minds and the share the body, they've come to a, at least a decent understanding. They may have disagreements, but it's not so much the bickering that he used to do on season one, which really, really irked me. But in any case, please as punch about season two overall. I can't wait for see, uh, season three. But where? This is my beef. I heard and I prayed and I waited and it didn't happen. Constantine was supposed to be in the series if season 2 was going to be picked up that never happened and I wanted that to happen season 3 could that happen it better happen I want it to happen but I have to wait to see what happens I'm just saying you can do this make it happen and I think you would need to make that happen because You need to have someone dealing with mystic arts somewhere in the mix. Considering Damien Dark was able to get the powers in the process much earlier than in the normal timeline. So, that's all I have right now for this podcast. And it's gone, again, way too long than normal. But again, I had a lot more information to give out this week than usual. Plus, I want to give a review for next week. We have the rewatch of John Carter coming out. I will have more sci-fi news as well as a review of the first episode of the new Mystery Science Theater 3000 series, which is coming to Netflix on April 14th. So I'm off and I plan to watch this and it comes out Thursday night, hopefully at midnight so fingers crossed getting everything done but I should get this out a lot more in a timely fashion than I have right now so aside from that I just want to take a moment here this past week I don't know what has happened but my numbers have skyrocketed to the point that I've never ever seen before so I thank you very much from the bottom of my heart, that you guys are actually are listening. Now, I would love it even more if you are listening to this and you see my show notes, 
there is a link in my show notes about a quick little survey. Please fill this out for me as a way of supporting my podcast because I'm going to be at a certain point if I maintain the amount of downloads per month I'll be able to do ads and do shared revenue with my host site so I would love to generate money that way but I'm not asking you to give me money all I'm asking you is to give me your time do a quick survey I think it's like four or five questions nothing more so once you do that I am eternally grateful for your help on that so like I said there are more podcasts coming out I'll keep them doing it as much as I can because again the numbers are out and I'm really happy the way things are going so I am tired I have to work tomorrow but damn it you like me (laughs) you don't (laughs) I don't like myself. All right, so that's it. I got nothing else. So I'll talk to you guys soon. Follow me on the various social networks. You can always email me at monster sci fi show at gmail.com. So, again, thank you very much for listening to the Monster Sci Fi Show. Sci fi from a certain point of view. Good night. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network, your station for all things geek, classic, current, and beyond. Be part of the crew at esonetwork.com.